Black Shirts and Reds by Michael Perenni. Section. Some Durable Basics. With the overthrow of communist governments in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, announcements about the moribund nature of, quote, Marxist dogma poured forth with renewed vigor. But Marx's major work was Capital, a study not of, quote, existing socialism, which actually did not exist in his day, but of capitalism, a subject that remains terribly relevant to our lives. It would make more sense to declare Marxism obsolete if and when capitalism is abolished rather than socialism. I wish to argue not merely that Marx is still relevant, but that he is more relevant today than he was in the 19th century that the forces of capitalist motion and development are operating with greater scope than when he first studied them. This is not to say that everything Marx and Engels anticipated has come true. Their work was not a perfect prophecy, but an imperfect, incomplete science, like all sciences, directed towards understanding a capitalism that leaves its bloody footprints upon the world as never before. Some of Marxism's basic postulates are as follows. In order to live, human beings must produce. People cannot live by bread alone, but neither can they live without bread. This does not mean all human activity can be reduced to material motives, but that all activity is linked to a material base. A work of art may have no direct economic motive attached to it, Yet its creation would be impossible if there did not exist the material conditions that allowed the artist to create and show the work to interested audiences who have the time for art. What people need for survival is found in nature, but rarely in a form suitable for immediate consumption. Labor, therefore, becomes a primary condition of human existence. But labor is more than a way of providing for survival. It is one of the means whereby people develop their material and cultural life, acquiring knowledge and new modes of social organization. The conflicting class interests that evolve around the productive forces shape the development of a social system. When we speak of early horticultural societies, or of slave, or feudal, or mercantile, or industrial capitalist societies. We are recognizing how the basic economic relations leave a defining stamp on a given social order. Capitalist theorists present capital as a creative providential force. As they would have it, capital gives shape and opportunity to labor. Capital creates production, jobs, new technologies, and a general prosperity. Marxists turn the equation around. They argue that, of itself, capital cannot produce anything. It is the thing that is produced by labor. Only human labor can create the farm and the factory, the machine and the computer. And in a class society, the wealth so produced by many is accumulated in the hands of relatively few, who soon translate their economic power into political and cultural power in order to better secure the exploitative social order that so favors them. The standard, quote, trickle-down theory says that the accumulation of wealth at the top eventually brings more prosperity to the rest of us below. A rising tide lifts all boats. I would argue that in a class society, the accumulation of wealth fosters the spread of poverty. The wealthy few live off the backs of the impoverished many. There can be no rich slaveholders living in idle comfort without a mass of penniless slaves to support their luxurious lifestyle. No lords of the manor who live in opulence without a mass of impoverished landless serfs who till the Lord's lands from dawn to dusk. 
so too under capitalism. There can be no financial moguls and industrial tycoons without millions of underpaid and overworked employees. Exploitation can be measured not only in paltry wages, but in the disparity between the wealth created by the worker and the pay she or he receives. Thus, some professional athletes receive dramatically higher salaries than most people. But compared to the enormous wealth they produce for their owners, and taking into account the rigors and relative brevity of their careers, the injuries sustained, and the lack of lifelong benefits, it can be said they are exploited at a far higher rate than most workers. Conservative ideologues defend capitalism as the system that preserves culture, traditional values, the family, and community. Marxists would respond that capitalism has done more to undermine such things than any other system in history, given its wars, colonizations, and forced migrations, its enclosures, evictions, poverty wages, child labor, homelessness, underemployment, crime, drug infestation, and urban squalor. All over the world, the community in the broader sense, the Gemeinschaft with its so organic social relationships and strong reciprocal bonds of commonality and kinship, is forcibly transformed by global capital into commercialized, atomized, mass market societies. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels referred to capitalism's implacable drive to settle, quote, over the whole surface of the globe, creating, quote, a world after its own image. No system in history has been more relentless in battering down ancient and fragile cultures, pulverizing centuries-old practices in a matter of years, devouring the resources of whole regions, and standardizing the varieties of human experience. Big capital has no commitment to anything but capital accumulation, no loyalty to any nation, culture, or people. It moves inexorably according to its inner imperative to accumulate at the highest possible rate, without concern for human and environmental costs. The first law of the market is to make the largest possible profit from other people's labor. Private profitability, rather than human need, is the determining condition of private investment. There prevails a rational systemization of human endeavor in pursuit of a socially irrational end. Quote, accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. End of section.